you, Catherine. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'll try to give you my best insights into the topic of German leadership and Germany's role and responsibility in Europe. And I am much more looking forward to the discussion afterwards, frankly. So if we think about German leadership, this mostly goes back to the year 2010 for at least Germans' leadership in the European Union and the hot debate that started then when um, the sovereign debt crisis hit several countries in the euro area, banking and sovereign debt crisis, obviously. And Germany, that has always been a constructive, long-term oriented partner and country in the European Union, suddenly moved to center stage of policymaking and seemed to be the one key pivotal player among the member states to keep the club together. And since that time, Germany got as much praise as it got criticism. Some praised it for the ability to actually navigate pretty well between crisis management, which sometimes required very quick, very, very big decisions overnight, and the ability to keep a strategic perspective on the long-term issues and that every move in crisis management may actually mean changing fundamental elements in the setup of the European Union if you get it wrong, but also if you get it right, that you create path dependencies for future developments you really need to think about. That is why in the Euro crisis, Germany was able to combine crisis management measures, which it agreed to, often late and after very serious domestic debates, um, with always a push for the reform of the Eurozone. All of that always in a very German way, and that's where part of the criticism emerged, because um, German policymakers have strong convictions about how economic policy should be designed, how fiscal policy should be designed, and how the architecture of the Eurozone should work um, in order to maintain a stable currency and a competitive economy. That was possibly not always right, and it was never uncontested. And that is why Germany suddenly became the subject matter of a lot of very harsh criticism in very polemic terms and in very, let's say, um, in violent ways. And unfortunately, there was also in the German press sometimes some reaction which one could judge as prejudiced on other European partners. So I would say, that in the context of the sovereign debt crisis, what we have seen in the public discussion between member states is a breaching of taboos, um, where for decades um, dealing with conflict in the European Union was mostly done behind closed doors and never in that public way. This became an element where Germany then suddenly had to worry about its image and its leadership capacity in informal ways in the European Union. In the Eurozone crisis, nevertheless, Germany was able to take or, or have a very strong impact on the actual policy choices made, which was due to several elements. One was obviously its relatively solid own economic position at the time, its uh, own economic size and hence its contribution to all rescue mechanisms, which is 27% in all the uh, sovereign debt mechanisms, uh, sort of the, the financial mechanisms to handle the sovereign debt crisis, and together with France, by the way, almost 50%, 47% of the Eurozone GDP lies in those two countries. So as soon as there was a Franco-German compromise, there was a very high probability that this would be um, the chosen solution in the Eurozone. Secondly, Germany had very credible and strong domestic veto players, which was um, key for the government to actually be able to shape policy choices because what happened was that in the question of designing rescue packages, um, the government could say, incredibly say, if this or that principle is not respected, the Bundestag will not ratify. And the German parliament had to ratify every single decision. Secondly, the German constitutional court um, said very clearly when it had to take the decision whether Germany could enter the Euro, well not the Eurozone, it wasn't called that way then, it was called the European Monetary Union, 
back in the 1990s, it said only because there is a no bailout clause and Germans can never be obliged to bail out others. That was the reason why initially the German government never wanted to call any financial aid a bailout because that was legally not, not acceptable. But it was financial aid and supposed to be liquidity help. So those veto players obviously were a problem at home, but strengthened the negotiation position of German policymakers considerably in all EU negotiations. Germany, I think, at that time, never seriously doubted its own interest to keep the euro together because German economic success depends on the single market. It depends on stable currency relations in the European Union, so the absence of exchange rates is the best thing that could happen. And obviously, uh, the sovereign debt crisis as it unfolded in Greece was a, was a tremendous threat to German and French banks as well. So there was a very, very direct uh, national interest to do this. But there was also a very strong and audible European case that was made. So all that is to say that when Germany moved to that center position of leading uh, the European <coughs> Union, as some saw it, um, it did this with um, many resources for its power. I'm jumping forward a bit and looking at the current situation with the migration crisis. Only five years later, um, another crisis that seems to be existential for the European Union and the principles that underlie integration, mm -hmm. um, namely the absence of borders, the free movement of people, the creation of, um, of not only a single market, but also um, of cooperation in justice and home affairs, so freedom of movement and all these things. Um, Germany clearly sees, or the German government sees, that it in no way has the same ability to influence the European response to this crisis. The tools it has at its disposal um, the, uh, the, uh, the way to convince its partners to do something that looks like a European solution to the crisis, the situation is simply completely different to the Eurozone. And I think policymakers only learned that in the last few months, that the power resources are, are not there in the same way. As far as I observe the discussion in Berlin, there is a very firm and strong belief that the only solution to what we are currently seeing happening in Europe, but also in its neighborhood, is um, a European answer. And that is mostly about working with countries of origin and transit countries. It is about European border control externally, and it is about a somewhat fair distribution of those who have a right to asylum across the European Union. Um, Merkel has been very liberal in her approach to uh, the migration flows, and you know that at a certain point she said what she said about Syrians being welcome in Germany, which was at the time interpreted as an act of humanitarian responsibility and moral leadership but it was also criticized for being not coordinated with the European partners um, and Germany going alone, basically. And there was a lot of criticism that this, what she said, actually caused more migration flows than would have been there anyway. I think one needs to see one additional element which is key from the German perspective, and that is that when Hungary threatened to stop the migration flows on its own external border and close up, um, there was a very strong feeling that if that happens, this would actually endanger the whole idea of having abolished borders within the Schengen area and having free movement in the European Union as a whole. So the assessment that I've heard many times in Berlin was that it was better to show more openness to take pressure of some countries um, to prevent that borders close up. This, of course, didn't succeed in all ways as hoped, but this reasoning is also why I think that Germany is very likely to maintain, as long as it's care, it can, its current stance 
saying we are not closing our borders within the European Union. Um, the current government, of course, is under strong domestic pressure uh, on that issue, in particular from Bavaria. But as far as I can see, there is a very consistent um, position in the government that this is the right policy to pursue. And what is now happening is very clearly a race against time because the political support for Merkel's policy and the government as a whole really depends on the ability to reduce migration flows this year. Last year, Germany took in a million refugees. Those are the official numbers. Some of them will and can be sent home because they have no right to asylum. About 200,000 are already identified as not legally present in Germany. Um, and the question, of course, is how Germany can change its own approach to this, because so far we have been very slow in sending people home. But there's a sentiment that this needs to change in order to make it visible that it's not worthwhile coming if you don't have a right to asylum. And it is also a sign of credibility for the government to actually prove that the situation is under control. I'd like to briefly comment on Germany's situation in the EU28 and the way, from the Berlin perspective, um, Germans tend to think about partnerships with other countries. So I think there is no doubt that in particular in the situation where we have multiple crises and a very complex situation of handling them, um, that Germany cannot solve anything alone, <clears throat> nothing really. And it needs partners, and of course, the go-to place still is Paris. Now, France hasn't been particularly forward-leaning and present on EU issues for a while, but the situation changed last year with the horrific attacks, first Charlie Hebdo and then the attacks, terrorist attacks in Paris, where France somewhat went back to its proactive role on foreign and security policy and actually put a very clear ask on the table with um, the decision to evoke the solidarity clause in the EU treaty, basically telling its partners it needs uh, support in handling the terrorist attacks um, and the terrorist threat more broadly. For Berlin, this was a challenge because it was absolutely clear immediately that there was no way not to react in a way that would seem like really showing solidarity. But at the same time, as you may know, Germany is traditionally, um, post-war Germany, very hesitant to quickly employ military means. And the question then was, how can Germany answer that French quest for solidarity? It took a while, almost two weeks, until the decision was taken. But the decision that then was taken, from a German perspective at least, was pretty substantive, to send more troops to Mali. Some more troops were planned anyway, but the number was increased. And also to be of assistance to the French military operations in the Middle East. The interesting thing about this decision was that despite the correlation with the decision to prolong the mission in Afghanistan, where Germany continues to have a very strong presence in the north, that despite the fact that those two decisions had to be taken literally at the same moment in the German parliament, there was no very, very strong controversy in the media or even obviously in parliament there were critics, but in no way was there at some point any doubt that this decision would be taken. And I think it shows a very important result of an ongoing discussion about Germany's own role and responsibility in Europe and beyond. This was very explicitly launched by the current foreign, foreign, foreign minister, um, Frank-Walter Steinmeier. When he came into office for the second time, he said, I will do a review of German foreign policy in all its dimensions, because the world is changing, Germany's role is changing. It was very much under the impression that also because of the situation in the European Union and the intense debate on Germany's role, there should not only be a debate about Germany, but also a German debate about, about Germany and what this country should do in terms of foreign policy and also defense policy. 
the review was interesting because in a very German way, it was, first of all, a very broad discussion that was organized with um, many experts asked to analyze um, German foreign policy along two questions. One was, what if anything went wrong? And then what, if anything, can we do better? So a number of experts, including myself from Germany, were asked to answer those questions in whichever topical or regional area they wanted to pick. And then the same number of international experts was asked. And all of this was published and made uh, the subject matter of a uh, large international conference in Berlin. Then followed an internal phase in the foreign ministry where um, not only strategies and objectives were reviewed, but also the way the ministry is actually built to answer to those challenges. And the third element was a very, very ambitious series of town hall meetings throughout Germany to get an understanding of where the society is on those issues. Because the sentiment was that Germans generally don't wish a stronger engagement of uh, the country internationally. But it has proven that slowly there was a first big opinion poll done as part of this process and then a follow-up one that this is clearly slowly shifting. And I think this is the function of two elements. One is the situation in the world is changing so rapidly and so radically that there's a broad sentiment that we cannot not do anything. And there's also a sentiment that important allies such as the US um, have additional interests and are not only as they used to be or not primarily focused on <coughs> Europe. So that sentiment of Europe has to become stronger and who, if not Germany, contributes, um, I think is very present in Germany as a whole these days. And the other element that in my perspective changes public opinion slowly but surely is that policymakers take a stronger stance in that discussion, German policymakers, who actually reflect on the question of German leadership and responsibility if you take the Munich Security Conference two years ago, where we had a lineup of speakers who actually put this issue at the center of their presentation, German policymakers, uh, also last year, then our federal president, the chancellor, you know, a number of people who actually made the case for Germany being more present and more engaged, and setting, in a way, the very broad objectives, which are that Germany will always lead through Europe. So there is a very, very clear commitment in the result of the review process, but also the political speeches that Germany sees its international role through the prism of the European Union. There is, of course, an issue with um, the partners. I've briefly spoken about France. Um, Germany never wants to lead alone, and um, the, the, the idea that the defense minister, Ursula von der Leyen, formulated a while ago um, saying we are leading from the center um, very much reflects that concept that it's not about going alone. But it's difficult to see where the partners are. A particular issue of concern from the Berlin perspective is the question of the British membership in the European Union. Um, there is a pretty strong engagement um, among uh, those responsible for negotiating that matter in Berlin to be constructive and helpful and try to find out how uh, the British ask can be accommodated. Um, but there's also a sufficient degree of realism that it's probably not the negotiation results that will decide which way the referendum goes, but many other factors, including um, the migration crisis and possibly a return of the euro crisis if it happens in the next few months. So um, a final word on another <clears throat> partner which is looked at with um, questions at the moment, that's of course Poland. Um, until the last general elections in Poland, the German-Polish relationship um, was very strong, very friendly and very constructive. Of course, there were issues like energy or climate policy where there was no immediate agreement, but there was a very strong sense of the strategic interest to have a solid relationship in particular since Russia attacked Ukraine, where the Polish government first of all asked the EU partners and the NATO partners to show a much stronger military response. 
and want to be part of the core group that handles the issue in the European Union, but then accepted that this was essentially done by Germany and France vis-a-vis -vis Putin um, and Ukraine. Um, this situation has dramatically changed since the Polish elections um, at the end of last year. Um, I would say uh, there's a big concern in Berlin about the topic of backsliding democracy in Poland, the reforms, the constitutional reforms that have been done, the decisions on media and courts are seen with a lot of concern. Um, but there is a clear sentiment that this should not end up in a public confrontation and hostility because Poland is simply too important a country and a further alienation from the German perspective is obviously not productive. But this is an issue to, to be observed um, in the next few months, how it plays out. Um, as you know, the European process in observing what's happening in Poland uh, is launched and we'll see how, how this all plays out. Let me conclude by saying that, like any country in the European Union, um, Germany is under constant pressure to deal with the multiple crises and the need to think long term. That means also to think about the future architecture of the European Union, how to deal with a possible Brexit if it comes, how to deal with the Eurozone, how to think about a further deepening of the Eurozone, how to, as I said, improve efforts to uh, make uh, or build a stronger EU border control and also um, to think about stronger European approaches to defense policy, um, which is obviously so far only done in an intergovernmental way. But while those are all big concerns, I would say I have rarely witnessed a situation where there was so much caution to actually believe that a big thing can be done, simply because treaty reform seems to be almost impossible to handle. And the assumption is broadly that we have to move ahead incrementally with certain elements that, for instance, the Eurozone still needs wherever possible. They should be done to sec through secondary law or, if necessary, through intergovernmental arrangements. Um, but that, indeed, the reflection needs to be prepared for a moment of deep, deep crisis, whether there then needs to be a leap forward, that is really substantive. And as I said, Brexit is a very, very uh, negative and worst case scenario from the Berlin perspective. But I would expect, if I close on that sort of uh, forward uh, looking note, that if ever this would become a likely scenario in the next month to come, I would expect Berlin to be prepared in order to not let the EU unravel, keep those parts together that wish to be, and be a very constructive player in the attempt to, in particular, um, provide a vision together with others as needed um, on a potential deepening at the same time. I'm very much looking forward to your comments and um, questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.